Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a Crime Story podcast. I am your host, Kaylin Lois, and I'm so excited to have you here today for I have a crazy story to tell you. I want to remind you that a Crime Story podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, the website Podbean, as well as my YouTube channel, A Crime Story Podcast. If you want to follow along with my Instagram at a crime story pod, you can see photos of today's case. Now, let's hop into the story because it is mind boggling. Let's get started. Before I start the crime story, I should provide you a little background about Iceland's legal system. It operates on civil law system and it finds influence from the Danish legal system. The courts are divided into district courts and the Supreme Court and Iceland abolished capital punishment very early in 1928, which I find crazy and very ahead of the times. So a little bit about Iceland. I actually flew through the capital of Iceland, Reykjavik, Um, when I moved here to France on the now defunct airline. Wow. And what I noticed when I was in Iceland is that um, one of the restaurants was um, selling whale meat, which I found very interesting, Um, and that it was crazy expensive there. And customs in Iceland, they were very strict, which I found a little odd, but of course I understand. So, Iceland is a Nordic country nestled between Greenland and the European continent. Iceland actually lies on the North American and European tectonic plate. Therefore, there are a lot of volcanoes in Iceland, and there's actually some of the world's most active. With Nordic traditions, the country has a population of 360,000 people, and it has its own language, Icelandic, which is supposedly one of the hardest languages to learn from any language I can't even imagine from English. Iceland is known as the land of fire and ice, and Iceland has an extremely low crime rate. The murder rate in Iceland is actually 20 times lower than the world average, and Iceland recorded just one violent death in the year 2012. Perhaps this is why today's story fascinates me so much. Our crime story involves two disappearances and not one but six confessions. Talk about reasonable doubt, but did they even do it? Listen to the story that has gripped Iceland for the past four and a half decades. Our crime story takes place in 1974 with an 18-year-old boy named Guthmunder Einarsson a pale young man with long brown hair and a very pronounced jaw. He was regarded as calm, quiet, and he would never lose an arm wrestle. Guthmunder had just finished high school and wanted to become a mechanic, and at the time of our story, he was working as a laborer. On January 26, 1974, Guthmunder, along with some friends, went to a rough-and-tumble nightclub in the city about 10 kilometers south of the capital, Reykjavik. Guthmunder got drunk and stepped outside into the cold and started walking. At 2 a.m., two women spotted Guthmunder on the road near the nightclub from their car. He was seen with a man wearing a yellow shirt, who the woman Bolt described as being small in stature. The man in the yellow shirt threw himself across the hood of the car and the girls were understandably freaked out and drove off. Guthmunder was last seen between 2 and 3 a.m. by himself off the side of the road and he appeared to be very intoxicated. Guthmunder Anderson was never seen again after that. The next day, Guthmunder's father worried after his son has not returned home from a night out and contacted the police. Apparently, Guthmunder was a very good boy and he would always tell his parents when he wouldn't be home for a night so his father was very freaked out and as the word got out people worried that Guthmunder could have died from a drunken fight or that he wandered off into the lava fields while walking home weather may have played a role in the at night as a storm swept through the area and made the search more difficult to conduct no answers were sold from these searches, and Guthmunder Anderson seemed to vanish off the face of the earth. 
Ten months after the disappearance of Guthmunder Anderson on November 19, 1974, Gierfinner Anderson, no relation to Guthmunder, a 32-year-old man with a wife and two children living in Keklaviv, Iceland, about 50 kilometers southwest of Reykjavik, enters our story. That night, after Gierfinner finished dinner, a friend came over to watch television with him while his wife, Gufni, was out running errands. At 10 p.m., Gierfinner asked his friend for a ride to go meet someone at a cafe. While in the car, he stated that he should have brought a gun to the meeting. Whoever Gierfinner was supposed to meet at the cafe failed to meet up, so he ended up walking home. Upon returning home, the telephone rang, and Gierfinner's son picked it up and heard an unfamiliar voice asking for his father. Gierfinner was handed the phone and said, I've already came. Pause. Okay, I'm coming. And then he left back in his car to the cafe. The next day, Gierfinner had not returned home. His car was found unlocked with keys still inside near the cafe. Gierfinner has not been seen since. Unlike Guthmunder's case, Gierfinner's disappearance definitely had a criminal element to it. Foul play was suspected. Who had Gierfinner gone to meet, and why did he feel that he needed to be armed? What happened that night of November 17th in the cafe? A week later, a clay sculpture of the man talking on a payphone outside of the cafe was created. They named the statue Clayfinner, and every person in Iceland knows about Clayfinner, who honestly looks like any other man. Now I'm going to transition a little bit and I'm going to tell you about a different cast of characters, starting with Erla Butladauter. Born in Reykjavik, Iceland in 1955, Erla was a blonde haired and was thin. Known for her exuberant and outgoing personality, Erla loved American television and in fact she lived in the United States for a little bit when she was younger due to her father's profession. According to Icelandic tradition, children will work on farms during the summer and when Erla was working on a farm in remote Iceland, she was sexually assaulted. Her family noticed a shift in Erla's behavior after this. She stole money from her father, she started smoking cigarettes, and missing her curfew. While at a party in 1973, Ertla met Sivar Sizowski and the two started dating. Sivar, who was small in stature, had shoulder-length brown hair and was born in Iceland to an Icelandic mother and a Polish father, which automatically made him different. Sivar grew up poor but was known to love art. The headstrong man freely shared his opinion and soon found himself in Breptevik Reform School after being busted for stealing and committing other petty crimes, it actually came out that Breitvedic Reform School committed grave injustices against its students. As the saying goes, there is someone for everyone, and Ertla saw Saivar as her man. Ertla became pregnant and gave birth to a daughter in 1975 named Julia. Saivar told Ertla how he wanted to commit the perfect crime. He just couldn't get crime out of his head, which to be fair to Saivar, I can't either. I just think we go about it in different ways. Ertla and Saivar started embezzling money from Ertla's work and the police were starting to close in on their scheme. In December 1975, Ertla and Saivar were arrested. Ertla and Saivar spent the night in solitary confinement and then were questioned the next day. They both denied the embezzlement, and when they weren't being questioned, they were in solitary confinement. This was the case for days, and Erla just wanted to go back home to her baby. So on the sixth day in custody, Erla spilled the beans about the crime. On December 19th, 1975, she signs a statement about the embezzlement and was ready to go back home. As she was leaving the prison, an officer asked, do you know a guy named Guthman or Anderson? She said, yeah, I know him. She stated that she rode with him in a car once and partied with him on occasion, and she thought he might have even had a crush on her. She had no idea that Guthmunder was even missing. The officers pressed her for more information about what she was doing the weekend that Guthmunder had disappeared. Repeating the question, do you know anything over for hours and hours? The questioning had turned into an interrogation, and Ertla says 
she remembers the nightmare that she once had. In the nightmare, Ertla has spent the evening at a nightclub before returning home. But around 3.30 to 4 a.m., she heard noises outside of her window. She knew that it couldn't have been Saivar because Saivar had traveled to Denmark. Outside of her window, she heard whispering and saw shadows of people. She recognized one of the voices to be Saivar and two of his friends. Ertla woke up to find that she had defecated the bed and was just terrified. Perhaps not buying the dream story, the police sent her back to solitary confinement, telling her that something had happened that night and she needed to remember it. Now, before I tell you more of the crime story, I want to talk a little bit about the psychology of solitary confinement. According to the American Psychology Association, people in solitary confinement are at a grave risk of psychological harm. People who spend extended time in solitary confinement can have trouble recognizing faces and their sense of direction can be skewed. Extended periods in solitary confinement can also decrease the size of the hippocampus in your brain. This region of the brain helps individuals with learning, memory, and spatial awareness. The sensory deprivation of solitary confinement can contribute to important health impairments such as alterations in cardiac rhythms, and in the internal biological clock that regulates overall and proper functioning of our bodies can also be skewed. Psycho psychologists actually see extended periods of solitary confinement as torture. Now back to the crime story. While psychology has serious misgivings about solitary confinement, the Iceland police at this time did not. Ertla's time in solitary confinement did seemingly improve her memory, and she now thought that the nightmare was not a nightmare, but a real-life event. Investigators questioned her about whether her nightmare could have been the weekend that Guthmunder had disappeared. Ertla confirmed that it could have been a possibility. On December 20th, 1975, authorities arrested Saivar and his friend Christian Weider Weidersen for involvement in the disappearance of Guthmunder Anderson. When investigators showed Saivar what Ertla had written down about the weekend of Guthmunder's disappearance, he said he was involved along with his friend Christian and two others, Trigvi Runar Leifsen and Albert Klon Stuffsen. Police rounded up all the suspects and arrested them two days later. Christian told the police the night of Guthmunder's disappearance that he was at Ertla and Saivar's house with Trigvi and Guthmunder. Christian's details get a bit murky here because he said he had drank too much. He stated that a fight broke out and then suddenly he drove off in a car with Ertla, but then they had come back to the house. He goes on to tell the police that Saivar and Trigvi had done something in the laundry room and then they put something heavy in the trunk of the car. They drove for about 15 minutes and disposed of something heavy and large enough to be a body. The problem with Christian's story is that his timeline makes no sense. There is no indication that Guthmunder, who was apparently a goody tissues, had ended up with a petty criminal like Saivar. It just didn't make sense. The boys were interviewed multiple times and their stories just became odder and odder and weird. Nothing feasible came to the surface. Nonetheless, the police each charged them with the disappearance of Guthmunder, even though there was not a shred of physical evidence. The police now think that they solved one crime Maybe they can solve another. The police asked Saifar about Yerfinner Anderson, who we remember disappeared after getting a phone call to go to the cafe. Saifar gave a statement in January 1976 that he saw Yerfinner the night of his disappearance. Saifar said that he went up for a drive with some men to collect Yerfinner from a cafe, but Yerfinner 
did not show up. Apparently, these geniuses were connecting with Gearfinner for a alcohol smuggling job. When Gearfinner did not meet them at the cafe, they called him and went to the docks to meet up. They went on a boat without Sivar and apparently got into an accident and claimed that Gearfinner had drowned. Ertla, Sivar, Christian, Ertla's half-brother, and a friend named Magnus Leopoldson admitted to being on the dock. Magnus Leopoldson had a resemblance to the clay head clay finner that I talked about earlier. Later, Trigvi and Albert admitted to being involved in Gearfinner's disappearance. The police also arrested Guthjan Skyfer Pettiosen, who happened to be a former teacher of Saivars. After spending 17 days in solitary confinement, Guthjan confessed to being involved in Gearfinner's murder. The boat story eventually evolved to it happening on land, and Ertla shot and killed Gearfinner. The Iceland false confession murders were held in solitary confinement for extended periods of times. Albert for 88 days, Ertla for 241 days, Guthjan for 412 days. Oh, it gets worse, guys. Trigvi for 627 days, Christian for 682 days, and Sivar for a whopping 7 hundred and forty one days all in solitary confinement remember what our friends in the field of psychology think about this to make matters even more harsh guards left the lights on when they tried to sleep they played loud music interrogated them for hours on end and Sivar claimed that one of the guards held his head under water in order to get him to confess this all sounds like torture to me. Christian attempted suicide twice and the authorities actually had him pose and recreate crime scene photos. Erla even questioned that if she had a baby while she was in solitary confinement. They were losing it. A detective named Gleesey Goodenson gave Guthjan a lie detector test in 1976. Guthjan broke down and said he didn't remember the murder happening. He didn't remember anything. One of the world's leading experts on false memories, Gisli Gudjansson, states that people can often and do remember events or adjust memories in ways that they never actually heard. False memory syndrome can certainly be caused by a traumatic episode such as a harsh interrogation or long-term solitary confinement. He states that Guthjian kept a diary while in solitary confinement, and Gisli states that this diary is the best example of false memory syndrome that he has ever seen. Gisli believes that the six suspects did not commit the murders, and they had no idea what even happened. And they just tried to appease and cooperate with the police so that they didn't get more solitary confinement. In 2018, the court acquitted everyone of their involvement in the disappearances of Guthmunder and Gearfinner. But Ertla still faces charges of perjury. And the acquittal of these crimes didn't do much since all six of them had served their sentences. Note that in Iceland, a life sentence really only means 20 years, and it's like that in most of Europe. So following the release, Saivar began to abuse alcohol. He lived in Colorado for a bit. He had two sons. He also lived in Denmark, and he enjoyed living in Colorado and Denmark because people didn't know who he was. Unfortunately, he died in 2011. After Guthjian's release, he moved to Denmark to study theology, and he returned to Iceland to become a priest. As of 2020, Ertla still lives in Iceland, and she's participated in documentaries covering her experience. Everyone in Iceland knows who Ertla is, and she finds life difficult. She finds it difficult to keep a job and just to have a normal life. Albert worked in construction, and Trigvi worked in a ship factory. Christian had a hard time after his release. He had trouble finding employment, and he returned to prison after a domestic assault on his wife. Christian recently passed away. The question still remains, what happened to Guthmunder Anerson and Gierfinner Anerson? Did the six who were arrested and charged actually have something to do with it? doubtful in my mind. 
There's no physical evidence that ties this to the crime, and most juries would see this as reasonable doubt. Honestly, I don't see much of any circumstantial evidence. It was just all stories. Another theory is that Guthmander walking drunk that night in 1974 could have frozen to death in the elements, slipped in, or he could have slipped into the, the lava or made his way to the ocean and drowned, or there could have been foul play by another person. But if there was foul play, I find it hard to believe that in the 46 years, nothing, no physical evidence has turned up and people love to talk. I can't imagine that someone would keep their mouth shut for that long, assuming that they're still alive. As to his body not being found, Iceland is sparsely populated with large isolated areas, so therefore I don't see it as impossible for him not to have been found. And after all these years, I don't think there would be much left to find. As for Gearfinner's case, the criminal element exists because of the phone call. I do believe that there was some sort of foul play that happened in this case. Now, I kind of have an out of left field theory. There are a lot of people in Iceland with the same name. When they asked Ertla if she knew a Guthmunder Anderson, she said, yeah, I know a couple. Which one? What if Guthmunder or Geirfinder was a case of mistaken identity? There's not a whole lot of surnames for men in Iceland, so I think this can further support my theory. I don't know, I'm just throwing something out there. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever get answers to the disappearances of Guthmunder Anderson and Geirfinder Anderson. What do you think happened to Guthmunder and Geirfinder? Do you think Ertla, Saivar, Christian, Trigvi, Albert, and Guthion? had something to do with it, I would love to hear your thoughts. You can comment on a Crime Stories Instagram at a Crime Story Pod, where I'll be posting images from today's story. Thank you so much for listening. If you could please leave a review of the podcast, it helps others find it. Also, if you could tell a friend about a crime story, I would greatly appreciate it. I hope to see you next time where I will be covering a crime story from international waters. You won't want to miss it. A Crime Story is hosted and written by me, Caitlin Lois. Sources for today's episodes can be found in the show's notes. Theme music is by Ross Budgen. Additional story editing is brought to you by my father, Mike. Francois Tardivolv helps me produce the show. Thank you for listening to A Crime Story. And remember to stay safe and be kind. (laughs) 